Alrighty, folks. Hello and welcome back. Today we are finishing up lesson number four. Um, last class we were almost done, just a couple more uh, slides left to go, so we'll touch upon that today, or finish that up today, and then we'll jump on to the, the lesson number five. So in this lesson, if you remember, what we have been focusing on was we were dealing with control statements uh, and, and loops. So the last thing that we were talking about is the family of applied functions. We had just gone through this last example, so let's switch over to the next slide here. So it is possible for more complex operations that we can combine control statements and loops together. So for example, here, what we have going on is a loop with a control statement inside of there, an if else statement. So we're looking at the, the loop here, what's happening in the for loop. Well, I is going to be iterated over the vector going from one to 10. So remember I takes, I is gonna go to one, then it's gonna go to two, then it's gonna go to three, all the way up to, to 10. Um, so starting off with the i is equal to one, what happens? Well, now that we're inside the loop, so we're inside the curly brackets here. First thing that checks is we have our control statement. We have an if statement. So it's saying if uh, i mod two is equal to zero. So if the remainder, when we divide by two is equal to zero, then what we wanna see happen is we want to print. Well, first together, we're gonna paste together a, um, a string. So we're gonna take i and we're gonna paste together with that is even. And then we're gonna print that out to the console. Now, on the other hand, if this is not true, so we can just use the, the simple else. Um, so if it's when div uh, dividing by two, it's not equal to zero, we get something that's going to be odd. Then we're gonna paste together. So we're creating the um, string i, whatever that value is, is odd, pasting that together and then printing that to the, the console. Um, and obviously we can make this more and more complex depending on, on our needs really at the end of the day. So definitely something to, to play around with, get comfortable with because um, yeah, these are gonna show up all the time. All right, so let's work through an advanced problem. I believe this is the last problem of this, this set of slides. So a good one to end off with. All right, so you were given a data set of students grades for multiple subjects. The data is stored in a data frame with the following columns. So we have student ID, we have math, science, English, and history. So math, science, English, history, those are the four subjects, and we have the student's ID. Now each grade is on a scale between zero to 100, and our task is as follows. So the first thing that we wanna do, we want to create a function called calculate grade. This is going to take a numerical grade and it's going to translate it into a letter grade based upon the following scale. So if they have a number grade that is between 90 and 100, then they're gonna get an A. Now on the other hand, if it's from 80 to 89, they're gonna get a B. 70, 79 is going to be a C, and 60 to 69 is gonna be a D, and anything below a 60 is going to be an F. Now obviously this is not how we follow things at Carleton, but this is a made up example, so let's just go with it here. So that's the first thing we have to do. We have to create that function. Then we're going to apply this function to each subject uh, column to create a new column um, for the letter grade. So we're gonna create a new column called math grade, science grade, English grade, and history grade. Now, how we want to apply it, again, using one of the applied family functions, we just wanna make sure we know which one we are, are using because they all kind of interact slightly differently. All right, then three, we want to create a function called calculate GPA, and that's gonna take a vector of letter grades and return a GPA based upon the following scale. All right, so um, if they have an A, they're gonna get a four. If they have a B, they're gonna get a three, a C a two, D a one, and F zero. So again, the first thing that we are doing is we are trained, or we're changing the percentage grades into a letter grades and then the letter grades into a uh, GPA number, a grade point average. All right, so four, we're gonna calculate the grade point average for each student and add a new column called GPA. So again, adding a new column to our data set or data frame. Uh, and then we I want to identify students with a GPA above a 3.5 and print their student ID and GPA uh, to the console. All right, so our data frame, which I provided here, we're going to call this grades. And again, it's made up of a column called student ID. So it's gonna go through one through five. Uh, grades for math, so we have a 95, uh, 67, 80, 45, 88. 
grades for science, so on and so forth. I'm not going to read through all of these. Um, but if we look at the, the first element of each one of these, that's going to represent one student, the second element, the second student, so on and so forth. All right, so let's begin this problem. So I need to jump over to, to R. All right, here we go. So the first thing, well, actually, let's make this a little bit bigger. So hopefully everyone will see. Um, where are we? There we go. All right, so they're a given data set. So grades, I'm assigning to the variable grades. We're creating a data frame. Whoops. Not the curly brackets, we have round brackets. There we go. All right, so we have student ID, and this is going to be a vector starting at one, going through five. Our next column is going to be math, and we're gonna create this using the combine function. So again, this is 95, uh, 67, 80, 45, 88. There we go. Comma, next one is going to be science. So combined, same idea, 78, 85, 89, 92, and 56. English, oops, combined, uh, 82, 75, 90, 61 and 77. Well, sure. Let's see if I get this a little bigger there. There we go. For any of you watching on a smaller screen, hopefully that helped a bit. All right, so for history, we have 70, uh, 68, 88, 93, and 84. There we go. And let's load this in. Perfect. And we can take a quick look at this. So grades, print this to the console. And as we see below, I have students one through five. I have the grades for math, science, English, and history. So if we go across each row, each row represents a single student. Okay, so the first part was, well, this wasn't part of the, the question, but we needed to enter the, the data frame because we're going to manipulate this. Okay, so the first part is um, for question one. There we go. Uh, we want to create a function. To calculate letter grades. And it already told us that we want to call this function calculate underscore grade. Oops. Underscore grade. There we go. Let's get this right. All right. So this is a function. So using the function call. And this needs to obviously take in a, um, a grade. So we're just going to call this numerical grade. There we go. Now remember, uh, unlike other programming languages, we don't actually have to define what the type of element that's going inside of here, as long as it's being uh, operated on correctly inside of there, we're not gonna end up with any issues. All right, so inside of here, how do we, how do we make sure that we're, we're assigning the right grade to it? Well, this is where we use control statements, specifically the if. So if uh, we look at numerical grades, so what we're just bringing into the function, uh, so numerical grade, if this is greater than or equal to a 90, then we want to do the following. We want to return, and we're going to return an A. All right. But we're not done the check here, because there was a couple of things that we, we needed to, to check. So if it was in between uh, a 90 to 100, it was an A. If it was in between an 80 to an 89, it was a B. Um, so it's not an all or nothing sort of case. So I can't just use an else to, to finish off this statement. I have to do a further check. So in this case, I'm doing an else if. So else if, again, my second check, so numerical grade. And I'm saying if this is greater than or equal to, to 80. Now, you might think we have to be careful here because these two things contradict, well, not really contradict one another, but they're not mutually exclusive because if I have something that's 80 or greater, that also falls into the category of 90 or greater. But here's the thing. 
the first thing that we check is making sure that or we're asking the question is this greater than or equal to 90 and if that is in fact true then we return so i'm using the return call which automatically terminates this function at that point in time so it's just going to return that so it's not even going to go check the remaining uh remainder of the the additional cases so um even though again they're not mutually exclusive 80 and 90 or greater than uh 80 greater than 90 fall into the same sort of category uh we don't have to worry about that that was a long-winded answer for for something that should have been really straightforward I haven't had enough caffeine yet today all right so if it's in between or if it's greater than an 80 we're returning this time a b and again we're not done so another else if uh numerical grade greater than or equal to 70 this time um and this time this is going to return a c we're almost there uh else if numerical grade greater than or equal to 60 we are going to return a d there we go and now everything else it doesn't matter so this is simply an else statement so else return f there we go so let's load this function in it's created and we see in the upper right corner in our global environments we have a function category now and calculate um grade is is in there so we are able to to call this all right so part two of this uh, we are looking to apply calculate grades the function we just created to each subject I guess so each subject column would be better there we go so remember in the the process of doing this we are also creating a new column so we're taking the information in um, from the the columns that we just created so for math we are creating a new column um that is called math grade so we're taking the the number grade changing it to a letter grade so if i want to add on an additional column here or i'm adding a new vector into this i want to use the s apply function because remember s apply returns a vector in the end so i can do uh, my calculations using the s apply it returns a vector then i can store that vector into my new column and i'm going to call that new column math grade all right so i'm adding this into the grades data frame that we've created and again we're creating a new column so i want to create something that's not here so we're going to do math grade all right so i'm going to apply to that we're doing the s apply and the first thing that i'm adding in is what is the the vector that i'm looking to apply the uh, function on so that is grades and we're specifically starting with the math grades and the second is what function are we using this is the function that we just created so this is calculate grade there we go and let's just run this one before we do anything else just to make sure everything is running correctly so control enter to this and let's print out grades to see our data frame again and making sure that everything is working correctly always a good thing to do so if I look at my new column math grades so these all came from the number grades in terms of math so the first number grade in math was a 95 so that falls into an A which is exactly what we have here uh, then we have a 67 well the 67 falls into a D which is exactly what we have uh, 80 is going to be a B 45 well anything less than 60 is going to be an F so that was assigned correctly and 88 is back to being a B so it looks like everything is being applied correctly Okay, so let's do the remainder of the um, of the subject grades here. So we have grades. I'm now going to apply to science, but remember, I'm not changing science. I'm changing or creating a new column called science grade. And basically, we could just cut and paste this and just changing up this last column here. Okay, so science. Let's enter that. I'm not going to print out the data frame each time. So grades. Whoops. Now we want English, but English grade is what we're calling the new column. So S apply. English. Calculate grade. And last but not least, 
we are doing this on history. Oops, history grade, because that's the new column we're creating. S supply, grades, history, and we're using our function calculate grade. There we go. Now let's print out the data frame again. So grades, notice that we have the four new columns. These represent the letter grades with respect to the number grades that we were in fact given. All right, so that works correctly. So part three of this, we are now asked to apply the, or we're asked to create a function to calculate a GPA, a grade point average. So first and foremost, it's an average, so we have to be able to deal with that, but we also have to be able to change our letter grades into a, a grade point. All right, so let's a, create uh, a function uh, to calculate GPA. All right, and it told us that we want to call this function uh, calculate underscore GPA. So since it's a function, again, we have to use that function call. This is going to take in a letter grade all right, so open our curly brackets. So the body of the function is happening here. Let's roll down a bit so we can see this a little better. All right, so I'm going to create a, a new vector inside of here. I'm going to call this GPA underscore scale. So this vector is going to help us map the letter grade that's coming in to a, uh, a grade point. So I'm creating the vector where I'm saying A is going to be equal to four grade points. B is equal to uh, three grade points. C is equal to two grade points. D is one. And F, well, that's zero. So I'm creating a, a named vector. By named, I'm meaning uh, that each of the entries in there has a specific name, so I can call it by that. Now, do keep in mind that uppercase, lowercase definitely matters. So when I'm saying A, I'm saying A in uppercase. If I were to put in a lowercase, well, it wouldn't recognize anything inside of there. Okay, so I've created a vector inside of my function, which is just going to help me map, again, the letter grade to an actual number. Okay, so what are we going to do now? Well, now... I want to convert what I had to a number grade. How do we do that? Well, I'm going to call this function, or sorry, call the vector that we just had. So GPA underscore scale. And I'm going to index this by going to the letter grade that was submitted in terms of our function. So uh, this is letter grade. So if the letter grade that was submitted to the function was an A, I'm going into the GPA scale and asking, what is the value in position A? That's going to return a four. Um, now I could do multiple um, elements at the same time. So I could input a, a vector of grades and it's going to return a vector of uh, grade points. And that's a, that's a key part there. So um, this returns I get a vector of grade points, but I want a grade point average. So I want the, the average or the mean of this. So I'm going to use the mean function. And we'll talk about the mean function a little bit more in the, the next lesson here. But now this is going to go through the vector. So it's going to take each element inside of the vector, add it up and divide by the length of the vector or the number of elements inside of there. Again, calculating an average. Um, and then I want to return the outcome of this. Now I could do this in multiple lines. But this is not overly difficult, and it's good practice to be able to combine everything into to one line. Like if it's very complicated, I may want to break this down into a couple of steps where the first thing I may want to do is calculate the vector um, of letter grades and then calculate the average and then return that value at that point in time. But here I want to do everything on, on one line. All right, so that is my function to calculate a GPA. Load that in, and if we notice in the upper right corner, again, in the functions part, calculate GPA is inside of there. All right, so we're done questions one through three. So question four, uh, this is where we're going to calculate GPA uh, for each student. Now, 
I could loop over uh, my data frame and, and do these calculations. But again, I have functions that help me apply functions. Um, I just need to be careful about whether I'm doing this for rows or if I'm doing this for columns. Now, remember that each row in my data frame represents a student. So I'm going to be doing this iterating over each row. So in order for us to do this, when I'm choosing my rows or my columns, I'm using the apply function. All right, so I'm going to store this grades. I'm going to store this into the uh, data frame that we created. So grades, I'm going to create a new column that it's asked uh, GPA. So using the applied function. Now I'm taking the first thing I want to do is input the, the data frame that I'm dealing with. So I'm using the grades data frame. Um, but I don't want everything inside of there because remember we've created new columns. So some columns represent um, a student ID, some represent a numerical grade and some represent a letter grade. What we're doing here is taking the letter grades only and converting those to a grade point. So I only want columns specifically dealing with letter grades. So I call my grades data frame. My square brackets means I'm looking to index over my rows and my columns. I want all of the rows. So I'm just going to go with a comma. So I'm doing nothing to the right or sorry, to the left of the comma. That's indicating I want all my rows, but I only want a very specific set of uh, columns. So my columns are going to be the ones that I've created. So I can use a vector in here to reference which ones I want. So C for my combined. And I want the ones that we have in fact created. So that's math grade. Uh, that is going to be... Well, it's a good thing I have actually right below my... Oh, right down there. Below my console what those uh, columns are. Uh, so I have science grade. English grade. And last but not least, history grade. Oops, no space. All right, so that's going to apply um, on my data frame with all of my rows, but just on those specific columns. Okay, so what else do we do from here? Well, my next entry, or my next argument inside here. So my first argument is, uh, the data frame that I am in fact using. Now, am I iterating over my rows or my columns? I'm iterating over my rows, so my value is going to be one. If it's my columns, my value is going to be two. All right, and the last thing that I have to enter is what function am I going to apply here? So this is going to be the calculate GPA. It's a little bit off screen, but that's okay. There we go. All right, calculate GPA. So if we apply this function, it should create a brand new column. And let's look at our data frame again. So grades. Perfect. So I have a new grade point average column. So the first student has a 2.75. Next student, 1.75, 3.25, 2.25, 2 and 2. Um, we can also verify that this is, in fact, correct. So if I look at the first student, the first student received an A. So an A represents a 4. Uh, they received a C in science, so that is a 2, so that brings us up to 6. Uh, B in English, so that's a 3, so that brings us up to 9. Um, and C, they received a 2, so that brings us up to 11. So 11 divided by 4, because there's 4 elements inside of there, is 2.75. So yeah, the calculation is done correctly. Perfect. That's always good to, to kind of check when we have a, a simple way of being able to check for this. Okay, so that's number 4. Last but not least... For part five here, we're looking to identify uh, students with GPAs above a 3.5, which we can actually see from the, the output of the console. No student has above the 3.5. Uh, but regardless of that, let's go through the check anyways. Um, and we want to print their student uh, ID, or should capitalize this because this represents a row, or sorry, a column in my data frame. So student ID um, and GPA that's also another column. All right, so we'll do high GPA uh, student. So we're going to create a vector. So we're not a, a vector. We're going to create a data frame where we're specifically looking at students um, with a grade point of, of 3.5 or, or better. All right, so I'm assigning to here. Whoops. There we go. My arrow from the grades data frame. I'm indexing. Now, specifically looking at the rows, so we're going through each one of the rows. I'm looking at my grades. 
my GPA column, and I'm asking the question, which one is greater than 3.5? Now, notice it says above a 3.5, not greater than or equal to 3.5, just strictly above 3.5. All right, so that's going to go through each one of my rows and determine which rows have students with above a 3.5. Okay, now I want specific columns. I don't want all columns because remember, I just want student ID and I want GPA. So I'm going to use the combined. I'm going to create a vector just indicating which columns I want. So the first one is going to be student ID and the second one is going to be GPA. All right, so if I run this, then we're going to print uh, high underscore GPA students. Perfect. All right, and print that, and what we see is there's nothing, which we already knew because looking at the output from below, uh, no student was above a 3.5, or no student even hit 3.5. The largest uh, GPA was a 3.25. So um, output's correct. If it was something else, so let's change this up. Actually, let's uh, say greater than 3. So if I run this, then print, notice that the third student has a GPA of a 3.25. So that worked. Okay. But if I go back to the original question, which was a 3.5 or above, uh, no, sorry, 3.5, not above a 3.5. There we go. Not including 3.5. Perfect. Um, if we're above that, awesome. All right. So that is, actually, let's jump back to my other screen here, making sure that this is the last slide for this section here. Yeah, that's it. That's all. Okay, perfect. Um, let's jump into the next little bit here. So just give me a second to, to change things up. I want our next lesson, lesson five. There we go. Let's start a new slideshow. I think that's everything. Yeah, it looks good to go. Okay, awesome. Let's begin. All right, so this is lesson number five. This is lecture number six. It doesn't always match up, but that's okay. Uh, so in this one, we're going to be talking about descriptive statistics and basic plots in R. So this is the foundations for data analysis in data science. So anytime we're given data, we want to be able to describe the data, and we want to be able to plot to get a visual idea of what's going on. So that's, that's really what we're going to be covering in today. Uh, today and probably the next class. We're not going to get through all of this, but that's okay. All right, so descriptive statistics summarizes and provides information about your data. So this lesson presents some basic comments or concepts, not comments. I'll have tons of comments, but the concepts here is what's being applied. Uh, so presents some basic concepts related to data description and graphical representation using R. Now, these concepts are not an alternative for proper training in statistics. So basically what I'm saying is I'm going to be hand-waving over a lot of this stuff, um, which is really the point of, of this. I'm, I'm giving you the general idea of what's happening here and how we implement this inside of R. But if you're looking for all the foundations, why we're doing this, um, an actual statistical course, which I believe most of you have to take anyways, is going to be a massive benefit for you. Um, so for a statistical novice, a, a lot of books on statistics are available and are free. Um, basically, you don't need anything too crazy, but um, any good stat book can't hurt. All right, so what is statistics? Statistics is the science of collecting, analyzing, interpreting, and presenting data. So the question is, why study statistics? Well, data-driven uh, decisions. These help us make informed decisions based upon the data. So making decisions based upon data analysis rather than, let's say, intuition or, or personal experience. So we don't want to let personal experience affect our decision making. We're doing this based upon the data that we are getting. Uh, why study statistics? Understanding trends. So identify patterns and trends in the data. So this helps us to understand how data points are, are moving and to predict future movements. And last but not least, predictive analysis. So provides tools for forecasting future events. 
Now, this is the type of things that we're going to see typically in machine learning models. We're not going to be touching upon that, or we may not be touching upon that in this class, depending on how, how far along we get. Um, but definitely, this is uh, a really interesting subject, um, which I highly encourage you, if you're enjoying this, uh, take a look into, into that, because R uh, can do a lot in terms of, of that as well. Uh, so for predictive analysis, think of this as, you know, where it helps businesses and organizations uh, plan for future by forecasting trends, demands, and say risks. So examples of this, uh, companies like Google, Amazon use data-driven decisions to personalize users' experience and optimize their operations. Uh, social media platforms like Twitter, or I guess that's X now, um, and Instagram uh, use trends to analyze and determine trending topics and hashtags. And last but not least, Netflix uses predictive analysis to recommend shows and movies to users based upon their viewing history. So these are all applications to exactly what we are talking about here. So again, why this is important. Uh, so the importance of statistics in data science. So statistics plays a major role in data analysis. So this is essential for interpreting complex data, for model building, so forms the basis of the algorithms used in machine learning. And of course, decision-making, which enables data-driven decision-making processes. So again, uh, examples of this, healthcare, predicting disease outbreaks, uh, finance, risk assessment and fraud detection, marketing, uh, customer uh, segmentation and, and targeting. All right. So back to the the general ideas. So that was kind of like the the lead into as to why we we why we want to study this because the applications are are vast and used in our everyday life. So now going back to the the general understanding of of statistics. In order to understand this, we have to know what the difference between a population and a sample is. So a population is the entire set of individuals or objects of interest. Um, or the measurements obtained from all individuals or objects of interest. Now, a sample, on the other hand, is just a subset or a portion or a part of a population of, of, an, of interest. Uh, and any characteristic of a population uh, object is referred to as a variable. <clears throat> so we measure the value of a variable on each object to, to generate data. And here we have a nice little picture here, which is kind of showing the the general idea so um, where's my pen here we go so if we think of all possible cars and we'll say this represents all possible cars in a given area but this is the only thing that we are interested in so like say all possible cars here at carlton um, if i wanted to take a that would represent a population if i wanted to take a sample of that i'm just going to select cars from here we're not going to talk about how we sample uh, but we're going to select cars from here and let's say out of this total i want to select six so these are the six that i'm going to select so they are from my entire population but they don't represent uh, or they don't they're not the entire population all right so the question is well well why do we sample well, it's often necessary to take samples instead of studying every member of a population due to one or more of the following reasons. Now, this is not all possible reasons, but there are many reasons out there for this. Uh, looks like I've done this in a weird sort of order. There we go. Let's just do it in this order. Uh, so cost effective, uh, less expensive than surveying an entire population. So there is a time component. There is a cost component to going out and... Um, asking questions to an entire population. If we can get a sample that represents the entire population, uh, we can do this faster and we can do this cheaper. So cost effective, time effective, faster to collect. So basically I've just combined one and two. Um, and three, feasibility. So sometimes it's impossible to collect data from an entire population. Uh, one reason for this, there might be a destructive nature to, to some of the tests. Let's think of that. What, what kind of destructive nature to to asking questions. Well, not asking questions, but being able to collect data uh, based upon uh, a population. So destructive nature, let's think of, we're creating a new children's toy and we wanna know how much stress can be put on the toy before it breaks. So in order for us to be able to test this, we actually have to put enough stress on the toy to thus break it. So. In order to find this out, we don't want to take all the toys that are created, 
stress them, break them, because we've just destroyed our entire population. If we can take a sample of this, a small portion of the, uh, of the toys, and perform those tests, and the outcome of that resembles what would happen into the entire population, then that's a much better approach and reasons why we sampled versus why we look at an entire population. All right. Uh, so what is meant by statistics? So a couple of definitions here. So a parameter is any number describing a whole population. So when we're talking about a population or characteristic of a whole population, we're talking about a parameter. This is what we would like to know and typically we do not know. Now a statistic is a number used to communicate a piece of information. So for example, your grade point average is, is a 3.5. Now this doesn't represent an entire population, this would represent a sample. So statistics is the science of collecting, organizing, presenting, analyzing, and interpreting data to assist in making more effective decisions. So as an example, I'm kind of using the, the 3.5 GPA, kind of that's a nice like, segue in from the the last example or that, that long-winded example that we just went through in R where we looked for students who had a 3.5 or above. None of them did, but regardless of that. Uh, so let's say, for example, your grade point average is a 3.5. Now, by collecting data and applying statistics, which again, applying the statistics is the collecting, organizing, presenting, analyzing, and interpreting data. Whew, that's a big one. Um, uh, you could determine the required average to be admitted to a college and the likelihood that you would be admitted. So given that you have a 3.5, is that enough? Well, how do we know if that's going to be enough? Well, we can look at patterns uh, of GPA requirements. Uh, have they been increasing or decreasing at the college that we're applying to? Are you within the range of acceptable GPAs from past? Um, if trends continue, what is the likelihood of you being admitted? Um, so we can use sample statistics to make educated guesses about uh, population parameters. So again, what we're looking for or looking for information or trying to estimate is a parameter. We're using statistics to be able to, to do that uh, based upon samples. There we go. Types of statistics. Uh, to the study of statistics is divided into two categories, which we can describe as descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. So descriptive statistics, that is what we are looking at today. So this involves methods of organizing, summarizing, and presenting data in an informative way. So examples of this, we're going to be looking at collect or not collecting the data, the data is going to be given to us. But in terms of being able to explain it, we're going to be looking at things such as the mean, the median, the mode, and standard deviation, and a smattering of other things. But that's just examples. Now, in terms of inferential statistics, this involves methods used to estimate a property of a population based upon a sample. So again, descriptive statistics, we are just describing the data that we have. We are not inferring anything from that. That's done with inferential statistics. Um, so you might think inferential statistics as a best guess of a population value based upon sample information. So examples of things that we would do in inferential statistics, this would be things like hypothesis testing, confidence interval regression analysis, uh, things that are not going to be focused upon in, in this class. But again, this is going to be a nice little lead into what you're going to be doing in your next statistics course. Or if you're taking the stat 1500 at a later point in time, you've already seen all this. So you're probably skipping ahead, but that's okay. All right, so descriptive statistics in data science. So examples of where we might see these types of things. Uh, so sports performance analysis. So the objective is to analyze player performance. So the descriptive statistics used could be uh, average points per game, shooting percentages, rebound statistics, now, a little fun fact, NBA teams use these statistics to, or to, to scout new talent and improve team performance. So if you have a, a team that has a specific grade, or not grade point, <laughs> um, average points per game, you want to increase it. You can need to bring in a player that is going to be above that to then raise up that overall GPA. Not GPA. Why do I keep saying GPA? School on the mind. There we go. Um, in terms of inferential statistics, we can think of things such as election polling. So the objective could be uh, to predict election outcomes. 
So inferential statistics used in this case could be sampling. So we're going to sample uh, from a population, whoever is going to be doing the voting, uh, look to calculate margins of error, and then of course, hypothesis testing. So fun fact, pollsters use inferential statistics to predict winners of elections with high accuracy. All right. Now let's look at types of variables. So the variables that we are going to be playing around with really can be broken down into two categories. And there's going to be subcategories of those two categories. But uh, the main two that we, we focus on is what's known as qualitative and quantitative. So qualitative, this could also be described as a categorical variable. This measures a quality or a characteristic of each unit. Um, so measurements of qualitative variables belong to one of several categories. So for example, of things that would be a qualitative or categorical variable, uh, religious affiliation, types of automobiles owned, country of birth, eye color. Now, the key parts to this uh, is these are all levels of a, a category. Um, they're not meant in any sort of way where we can do arithmetic on it. So if we're looking at types of automobiles owned, if you owned a Chevy, if you owned a Ford, these are options in the, the categories. You can't add them together to create a new element or new item within that, that category as well. So uh, basic arithmetic cannot be done in these. Now, it is possible to order them, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Sometimes it's possible, not all the time, but sometimes it is. Um, but again, we'll talk about that uh, in the next couple of slides here. All right, so quantitative is the other one, or you can think of this as a numerical variable. This measures a numerical quantity on each unit. Uh, for such measurements, it makes sense to do arithmetic operations. So it does make sense to add. It does make sense to multiply. Uh, this is, again, not the same in terms of a categorical variable. So things such as temperature, age, height, uh, scales, annual income, these are idea, or these are numerical variables, and again, makes sense to do basic arithmetic on it. All right, so talking about quantitative variables and specific classifications of these, uh, we break these down into two different parts. So again, as I said, each of these kind of has subcategories, so on and so forth. So when we're dealing with quantitative, we can talk about variables that are continuous and variables that are discrete. Excuse me. Uh, so in terms of continuous, a continuous variable can assume any value within a specific range. So think of this as I have an interval and in this interval, I can zoom in as close as I want. So assuming we had a device to measure infinite accuracy, we could measure, say, the duration of a flight to any level of, of decimal. So if I'm saying, let's measure the flight from Ottawa to Toronto, you know, it could be, ah, oh, we're looking at this, uh, 45 minutes. Well, if we wanted to get precise or even more precise than that, and we had the tools to be able to do so. Again, we can zoom in on this time interval and get as precise as we want. So an infinite amount of decimals. So examples of things that are continuous, and typically these have to do with some level of measurement. So we have tire pressure, weight of uh, shipment of grains, um, amount of cereal in a box, duration of a flight. So again, it may seem like the way we typically represent this is going to be in the discrete sense where it's going to be, you know, two, three decimal places. We stop there. Um, but if you think about this again, in terms of infinite precision, if we had a way to be able to measure that, then we could zoom in as much as we want to. Uh, so uses in data science, um, these are typically used in regression models, time series analysis. All right, now in terms of discrete variables, these can assume uh, only, or sorry, can only assume certain values, and there are usually gaps between these values. Now, discrete variables can be finite or they can be countable. So the set can be infinite, but we still have to be able to count it. So if I can iterate over it, so starting at one, going to two, to three, four, all the way up, if I keep counting it, that's fine, as long as it is in fact countable. Um, but here, the key part is there is clearly defined gap. So if I think of, again, the same idea as an interval, and I keep zooming in and zooming in and zooming in, there's a point in time where if I look between two, um, two possible values, there is nothing in between. But whereas a continuous variable, I can keep zooming in as infinitely close as I want, being as precise as I want. 
So typically these ones fall into the, the category of when we have to count things rather than when we have to measure things. All right, so examples, number of bedrooms in a house, number of cars arriving at a shopping center, number of students in a statistics course. All right, so what are the usage of uh, discrete variables in data science? Well, these are typically used in classification models and count data analysis. All right, so let's talk about levels of, of measurement. So data can be classified according to one of four levels of measurements. So we have nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. So the lowest level of measurement being the, the nominal and the highest being the ratio. So we're gonna go through a quick description and examples of each one of these um, and how they fall into what we were just talking about. So the nominal level, at the nominal level of measurement, observations of a qualitative variable can only be classified and counted. So what this means is there is going to be no order. So we're dealing with a categorical variable. Uh, if we're going out and collecting the data, all we can simply do is we can group them into their categories and count how many observations we have. That is it. That is all. There is no order to this. Uh, the nominal level has the following properties. So one, the variable of interest is divided into categories or outcomes. Um, and two, there is no natural order to the outcomes. So examples of this, color of M&Ms. So if I have a pack of M&Ms, I open that pack, I pour it out, I can group everything together, um, I can count how many colors are of each. But again, in terms of an order, one color is not um, greater than a, another color. So um, there is no natural order to that. All right, ordinal level. At the ordinal level of measurement, data classifications are ranked uh, or ordered according to a particular trait they possess, but we are not able to distinguish the magnitude between the difference uh, between the groups. So in this case, again, still talking about a uh, categorical variable, but now we're able to um, put some order to this. But the issue is how much is one greater than the other? Um, and if I looked at three things in order, so going from smallest to medium to large, is the interval between small and medium the same as the interval between medium and large? Again, we don't know. We just, we have an order, that's it, that is all. All right, so the properties of ordinal level of measurements are the following. So one, data are represented by an attribute. So same as before, and the data can only be ranked or ordered uh, because the ordinal level of measurement assigns relative value. So there is some natural ordering to be done to this. So for example, um, we can go on to, or you folks will know soon enough when we do the uh, professor ratings, um, there are categories such as, well, even though there's a number category to it, there's things such as, you know, what are the performances? Poor, good, great, excellent. Again, there is a natural ordering to this, but what is, you know, how much better is good than to, to great or something along those lines? I can't remember exactly what the, um, what it is, but we'll see it soon enough. Well, not too, too soon, but there you go. Um, excuse me. So no units. Uh, yeah. So in this case, no units. So no operations can be done on, on ranked data. Now, interval level, interval level of measurements includes all characteristics of the ordinal level, but in addition, the difference between values is a constant size. So now I can order things and there is a, a magnitude or we're able to explain a magnitude between each ordering. So properties of interval data uh, are as follows. So data classifications are ordered according to the amount of characteristic they possess. Equal distance or equal differences in characteristics are represented by equal differences in the, the numbers assigned to those classifications. So if I'm having something that uh, can take on values one through 10, um, the difference between one and two is the same as the difference between two and three. So example, temperatures in degrees Celsius. Right. Last but not least, ratio level. So ratio level of measurement has the characteristics of the interval level, but in addition, the zero point is meaningful and the ratio between the numbers is meaningful. So what do we mean by, by zero? So in ratio, it has a natural zero. So if we look at the example beforehand here in terms of interval, when we're saying temperature in degrees Celsius, 
Well, what is zero degrees Celsius? Is that the absence of temperature? No, of course not. It's still a temperature. It's starting to get pretty cold out there, uh, but it's not the absence of something. Whereas in the other hand here, when we're talking about a ratio level, we could think of zero as the, the absence of something. All right, so the properties of ratio levels uh, have the following. Data classifications are ordered uh, to the amount of characteristics they possess. Equal differences in the characteristics are represented by equal differences in the numbers assigned to the classification. So again, this is the same, but now the zero point is the absence of a characteristic and the ratio between the numbers is in fact meaningful. So examples here, wages. So what we get paid, if we get paid nothing, that is the absence of, of money. All right. So that was kind of the, the general introduction to the variables, how we play around with things, how it relates to everything else. Now let's get into the actual descriptive statistics side of things. So we're going to be looking at specific characteristics and how do we measure those characteristics uh, in terms of, of R. But we need a coffee break first. Excuse me. Yeah, so that was a lot without going through any R, so we're going to get back to the R programming. So a little less of me, well, shouldn't say a little less of me ranting, because I'm always going to be ranting here. Uh, but that's what you you come here for, hopefully, for those of you who are watching. Again, thank you for all who, uh, who make it this far in the video. What, we're 51 minutes in if you're watching at this point? Awesome. Thank you. You're great. Um, so descriptive statistics summarizes and provides information about your data. So they help understand the main features of a data set quickly. So examples of descriptive statistics, these are what we're going to be covering today. So we're going to be looking at the mean, which is the average of the, the set of numbers, the median, which is the middle value of a set of numbers, and the mode, the most frequently occurring value. So typically these three things, the mean, median, mode is a measure of the center of the data. Then from there, we have the standard deviation and the variance. So the standard deviation measures the amount of variation or dispersion in a set of values. So how spread out is the, the data from the center uh, and the variance, the average of the square differences from the mean. Again, we're going to be talking about all of this um, in a little bit more detail. So I'm kind of just quickly reading over the descriptions right now. Uh, another way of being able to talk about how the, the data is spread out is talking about the range. So that is the difference between the highest and the lowest of value. Uh, and we also have what's known as the IQR or interquartile range. Um, this is the range of the middle 50% of the data. So sometimes we don't want the extremes. So the 25% on the left, 25% on the right, we just want the 50% in the, the middle. All right, so let's jump into some of these. So again, we're going to start with mean, median, and mode. And these are all examples of what's known as central tendency. So it's a measure of the center location of the data, which is often referred to as averages. So the purpose of a measure of location is to pinpoint the center of the data. Uh, an average is the measure of the location that shows the center value of a data. So for example, the average number of hours college age students spend playing video games each week. Um, the average grade point, the average grade point average, eh, it works out there, uh, required to be accepted at your, your college or university. So how do we calculate this? Well, I would say it's difference between a, a population and a sample, but it's actually not. It's quite straightforward here. Uh, so for a population, for ungrouped data, the population mean is the sum of all population values divided by the total number of population values. So how we represent this, we use the Greek letter mu. So mu is equal to, I have a summation here, which means I'm summing over all values of X, where X represents every single value in a, a population. So for example, here, if I had a population of, um, of five people, and we asked the question, well, how many hours do you spend per week playing video games? The first person could say five, the next could say three, four, 10, and we'll say 25, there we go. Someone's gonna be a little bit of the extreme. So how do we calculate this population? And again, assuming it's a population because uh, I've said we're only dealing with these five individuals here, uh, not taking five from a, a bigger group. Uh, so it's a population. So we take the mu, which is equal to the sum of all values of X. So that's the sum of each one of these. 
So I'm taking the five, I'm adding the three, I'm adding the four, adding the 10, adding the 25, and then I'm dividing by N, which is the number of observations. So in this case, I'm dividing by five. So really nothing should be, should be new here, except maybe uh, the notation in terms of mu. And again, this is dealing with a population. Now, on the other hand, when we're dealing with a sample, very, very similar. The only real difference here is the fact that we are not dealing with the Greek letter mu anymore. We're dealing with X bar. So X bar represents a sample. And also notice here that my N is different. So if I go back here, I have a capital N, which represents the size of the entire population. My lowercase n represents the size of a sample. So same idea. If I had uh, this time, you know, 10 people, um, 5, 10, 20, 3, uh, 4, 6, 8, 7, 11, 9. There we go. So if this represented a, a population, in order for me to take a sample of this, I would say, let's select 5 from here. So I'm going to take you, 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 and you. And I wanted this average here. Well, I'm going to take those five values. I'm going to add them up and I'm going to divide by five. Now, again, my, my capital N here would be 10, but since I'm taking a sample of five, my lowercase n is five. Okay, so how do we do this inside of, of R? Well, R has a function called mean, which we input a vector inside of there, and it's going to add up every element inside of the vector, and it's going to divide by the number of elements inside of that vector, then return the, the output of that. So if I had a vector which is going to contain the values 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, I'm going to call this vector data. I'm going to put this vector into the function mean, and the output of this, well, if I add this up, if I add 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 to 6, so on and so forth, all the way up to 10, 10 observations of dividing by 10, I'm going to get 5.5. And you can verify that this is in fact true. So regardless if I'm doing this for a sample or if I'm doing this for a population, I'm still using just the mean function. All right, so properties of the, the mean, at least done in, in this way. Uh, or sorry. Um, no. Properties of the, the mean. Uh, so there's four main things that come here. So every set of interval data and ratio data does in fact have a mean. So it does in fact have a center, which we can calculate in this way. Um, remember interval data, ratio data, these are, there's units involved to them and there is clear um, measurable gaps, not measurable gaps, but a clear magnitude between each observation. Um, all values are included in the computation of the mean. So that's also another key factor here. The mean is unique. So if I try to calculate the mean over and over again, I'm not going to get a different value. It's always going to be exactly the same. Always uses all the uh, value points in the data that we are given. Um, and the sum of the deviations uh, of each value from the mean is equal to zero. So what exactly does that mean? And I think the picture here represents this, this nicely. We can consider the mean as a balance point for the data set. So if I think of this here as the mean, If I had this such as a teeter-totter and I had my, my weights and I put the weights in the respective places, this should sit perfectly flat. So it doesn't tilt to one side or the other side. It sits perfectly flat. And we can see this here. I have a mean of 5 and I have value points of 3, 4, and 8. So if I look at the, the total distance away, so if I look at the distance away from everything on the left-hand side and everything on the right-hand side, this should balance. So I have 4 and 5, so the distance between this is minus 1 because we're going to the left. I have 3 to 5, this is going to be a difference of 2 or minus 2 because, again, it's to the left of my, my balancing point. So if I add these together, I get minus 3. Now, 5 and 8, I only have one element on here, so that's a distance of 3 plus 3. So notice I have minus 3 plus 3. These things cancel out, and I get 0. So it's perfectly balanced. So when we're talking about the mean, it may not necessarily be one of the observations. And in this case, it's in fact not one of the observations, because the observations we have is 3, 4, and 8, and the mean here happens to be 5. 
but the mean is that perfect balancing point that if we put everything again on a teeter-totter which would go from side to side again if it's balanced perfectly which it would be with the mean it's going to stay perfectly flat okay so that's the mean now let's talk about the median so the median is slightly different here in the sense that the median is the midpoint of values after they have been ordered from minimum to maximum so what that means is if I find the median, then I know 50% of my values fall to the left of that and 50% of the values fall to the right of that. That is not true. Again, we can go back to the picture here in terms of the mean. Because in this case, the mean here shows I have two observations on my right, or sorry, on my left, and one observation on my, my right. So that doesn't make sense in terms of being 50% on the left, 50% on the, the right. And that's exactly what the median is. All right, so there are many uh, values above the, or sorry, there there are, I'll get this right, there are as many values above the median as below. So as I said, 50% of the data falls above, 50% of the data falls below. Now for an even set of values, the median will be, um, oh, I'm, I almost froze there. <laughs> what time are we at? hour and hour and that's why it's always gets long when you get to the the hour and I really should have thought about breaking this up but it takes a lot of work to break a video up into into the multiple parts I know everyone would probably appreciate that more uh, and again which is why I always like to say thank you for for sticking around this far um, so for an even set of values the median will be the mean of the two middle numbers what do we mean by that well let's go through an example here of when we have an odd number versus when we have an even number of observations All right, so for this example, the average of a sample uh, of seven banks employees are, sorry, the ages, I don't think I said that right, I think I said averages. That's it, caffeine break time. All right, the ages for a sample of seven bank employees are as follows. I think I said averages again. Oh, we'll get through this, I swear. Uh, so the ages are 31, 35, 29, 30, 32, 33, and 34. Now, the first thing that we want to do is we want to arrange the data from smallest to largest. So if I did this, I have 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35. Now I want to find the middle number. So let's start crossing off from either end. So I'm going to take the 29 off. I'm going to take the 35 off. The 30, 34, 31, 32. 33, ooh, 32 is what I'm left with. And I notice that I have three observations on my left, three observations on my right. So the th 32 is my middle number. Now notice the difference here between when we were dealing with the mean. With the mean, for the example that we showed with only the three observations, the three, four, and eight, the, the mean was five, which was not an observation. Here, when I'm dealing with an, um, with an odd number of observations, the the median will always be one of the observations. So in this case, 32 is an observation. 32 is in fact our mean because that is the middle number when we order things. But what happens if we have an even number of observations? So the weights of six patients in kilograms are as follows. So we have one that's 66, then 63, 70, 65, 64, and 62. Now, same idea, we want to arrange this from smallest to large. And if we do that, we have our 62, our 63, 64, 65, 66 and 70. Okay, so if I start crossing these things off, I take off the 62, I take off the 70, take off the 63, take off the 66. Ooh, wait a second. Now, if I take off the 64 and the 65, I have nothing else. But I want that middle. I want what is in between here. So how do we do that? I take the average of those two observations. So I take 64 plus 65, and I divide this by 2, which is going to get me 64.5. So it is the mean of the two middle observations. So notice the difference between an even and an odd. When I'm dealing with an odd, the median is in fact one of the observations. But when I'm dealing with a median, uh, sorry, when I'm dealing with an even number, that's not necessarily true. Now it can be true if say for example, um, instead of this being 65, this was also 64, because then the middle of 64 and 64 is still in fact 64. It would be one of those observations, but it's not necessarily guaranteed to be one of the observations. Okay, so now that we understand the basics of this, how do we do this inside of R? 
So given the same vector, so I have my data, which is the vector going from one all the way up to 10, I'm gonna use the median function, which is going to work in exactly the same way as the mean function, where I'm just going to put in the vector and it's going to return the middle value. So I'm using the median on the data, it's going to output 5.5. And let's see, is that exactly true? Well, I have an even number of observations, so I know I'm gonna to have to find the middle point of two. So if I start canceling these things off, and this is already in order for us, so I have one, 10 are gone, two, nine is gone, five or three and eight, four and seven. This leaves me with five and six. The middle point between five and six is 5.5. So there we go. Um, and I don't have to do anything special in this case. If I'm dealing with an even or an odd, it's going to do all of that for us. So I just need to use the median function. All right, a couple properties of the median. Um, it is not affected by extremely large or small values. So what do I mean by that? If we compare this to the mean, one of the properties of the mean is it uses all observations. Okay. But what happens if I have, you know, a couple of points here and then one point all the way over, all the way over here? Well, that point all the way over here is still going to be used. And if it has to be a balancing point, that median is going to shift where even if most of the data is in here, it's going to have to shift over here because, again, that balance has to be perfect. That's not the case when I'm talking about the median. It's not going to be pulled to the extreme because, again, it's dealing with that middle point where 50% of the data is on the left, 50% of the data is on the right. So it's not a balancing point. It's a position of, again, 50% on the left, 50% on the right. Um, so therefore, the, the median is a, a valuable measure um, of location when such values do occur. There we go, when extreme values do occur. Uh, it can be computed, holy jeez, it can be computed for ordinal data or higher. So if there is data that can in fact be ordered, same idea, we can find that, that middle ground for it. Um, but no meal, no, nothing we can do there. All right, last but not least, the mode. Uh, now, the mode is the, the value of the observation that appears most frequently. Now, R does not have a built-in function for calculating the mode because the mode is less commonly used compared to other summary statistics like the mean or median, especially in the context of continuous data. So the mode is more relevant for categorical data, and many statistical analysis and applications focus on numerical summaries where the mean and median are, are more informative. But if we wanted to do this, we can create a function inside of R uh, that will calculate the, the mode for us. So here's a simple function. You can create one on your own or you could use this one. It doesn't really matter. So what we do here is we're creating a mode underscore function using the function um, call and I'm going to input a vector x. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new vector call u of x which is going to look at all the unique values inside of x. That's it. That's all. Just look at all of the values in there, which ones are unique. So we're not looking at any levels of repetition. Okay. Then what we're going to do is I'm going to match up and build a table, which is going to help me calculate. I'm looking at all of the unique values and how many times they appear. Then I'm asking the question from this table, which again, it'll just be a row. It's going to be giving me, um, what the unique values are and how many times they show up, I ask the question, which value shows up the most times? And whatever value shows up the most times, again, I'm pulling, uh, sorry, what position shows up the most times and I'm pulling that value uh, from my unique value um, vector that was just created. Um, I really should actually have a return on there as well poor form on my end. And it, it's still going to return the very last line. But as I said beforehand, when we're dealing with functions, you really shouldn't do that. If we have a function, there should be a return element to that. Um, and in this case, that's exactly what we do. So uh, an example, and you can again, try this one on your, your own. So if I have a vector data, which is going to be made up of the following. So I'm going to have um, the value 200, and I'm using the, the repeated function here, I'm going to repeat the value 200 five times. Uh, and also from there, I'm going to do in between 100 and 200, I'm going to use the sample function. We haven't talked about this yet, but we will uh, definitely in the next little bit. I am going to take 10 elements from 
the values 100 to 200. So this is going in there. So in between 100 and 200, I'm looking at the integers between those two uh, because this is a vector here. Remember that colon notation means I'm starting at 100. I'm going all the way up to 200. So that's a vector of size 100. I'm grabbing 10 elements from there and I'm sampling. So this is done randomly. All right, so I have 10 values that are between 100 and 200 and specifically five values at 200. So I have 15 values in total. So if I call this, this mode underscore function on my data, what should output is, is 200 because I put that in there five times where everything else should, if it's again coming up randomly, uh, the values between 100 and 200 should all be, be unique. All right, so this function works in the following way. It finds the unique values in the data set, as I already said, counting the occurrence of each unique value and returning the value of the highest count. Perfect. All right, so where does the mean, median, and mode kind of help us when we're talking about um, the spread of the data? And that's what we're going to be getting into to next. So right now we've established where the center of the data is, but how spread or how is the spread of the data in relation to that? So here's the thing. If I know that the mean, median, and mode are all exactly the same, what we tend to end up with is something that is going to be symmetric. So by symmetric, that means if I take the middle of this and I fold it right on that middle there, what shows on my left-hand side should be a mirror image is what shows on my right-hand side. Now, on the other hand, if I have a median, which is located right here, and a mean, which is located right here, that mean, remember, that mean is being pulled by extreme observations, where the median is 50% of the data on the left, 50% of the data on the right. If the mean is being pulled to one side, we say the data is being skewed. And for this example here, it's saying it's being skewed right. So I have a tail that's heading to the right. Or we could think of this as positively skewed. Now, on the other hand, if I had a median here and a mean here, my mean is now being pulled to the left of the, the median. So again, the 50% of the data mark, my mean is being pulled to the left of that, which means I have smaller extreme observations. And this is again skewed, but this time it's skewed left or negatively skewed. So understanding the mean and the median kind of gives us a general feel for how the spread of the data is going to be. Is it symmetric? Is it skewed left? Is it skewed right? All right, we'll get into this last little bit here. Actually, you know what? I think this is a good place because we're about an hour and 15 minutes in. So we'll we'll cut it a little bit early and we'll start talking about the, the dispersion in the, the next class. So we'll finish up lesson number uh, lesson number five in the yeah, in the next class. So we'll see you then.